Hey, Grace family and friends, we hope you're well wherever you may be. In these strange days we're living through where our lives have been so disrupted and we've been having to adapt to fluid circumstances, it seems, every week, it's all requiring a lot of us and revealing a lot about us. Are you noticing that? But as the people of God, the one thing that is not changing, the thing that we can hold on to, is the security we have in our loving, sovereign Lord who is in charge and at work in and around us. Unfortunately, sometimes we have a hard time seeing things from that perspective. We can't, as they say, see the forest for the trees. Well, today we're going to attend to that issue. It's September 6, Labor Day weekend, a time that typically represents for us the transition from summer to fall. Kids are back at it with school in some form or another. Summertime comes to a close, and though summer has been far from normal, and even what we can expect with fall is far from certain, we thought it would be good and important to take this time of transition to reflect. Have you done that much? In the midst of all the upheaval, all the change, in light of all that has been taken away from many of us, the risk is that we become consumed with the negative, with what's all wrong, or with all the things we don't like or we're upset at. But if that's what dominates our thought life, then we're missing some really important insights. Last week, we finished our series on the one another's, and next week we're so excited to be able to start gathering in person in a larger group context on our patio and with a brand new series to explore together. But this week is a week of in-between, a transition moment that we're going to do something a little bit different with. We're going to carve out some space today to reflect on some things. Space to look back on the summer, as well as to look ahead to this fall. And we'll have two sections to do this in the middle of this video. We're going to be in Scripture together, and we'll give you plenty to think about. But some of the main content will be your own work of reflection. You can do this whether you're watching this on your own, or with family, friends, or with your home gathering. So let's prepare ourselves for this work. And let's invite God to help us along the way. So will you pray with me? Father, we present ourselves before you and ask that your Spirit would reveal to us what you want us to see. As we reflect on this summer past, would you make us awake to the work you've been up to? May your Spirit reveal to us things about ourselves. Help us to see what you want us to see. Your refining hand molding us, shaping us, disciplining us, maturing us. And as we look forward to what's in front of us, would you direct our path? May we walk in your way and may we step into the work you prepared for us. We offer ourselves to you now, Lord. Amen. Let's spend some time together now worshiping God through song. He is faithful. He is faithful through all seasons. He is a God who is good every day. And we move, but he is stable and he is steady. So let's bring ourselves before him now and worship that stable and consistent and faithful God. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. 
just as we got in my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul.
Today I'll be reading some excerpts from Joshua 3 through 5. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out and went to the Jordan River, where they camped before crossing over. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for the, tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. The next day, when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. The priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, right from where the priests stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and commanded them to do as the Lord had said. Now the priests who carried the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people. When the priests came up out of the river carrying the ark of the covenant, no sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed the river. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just as he had done to the Red Sea when he dried up before us until we crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. So as Mark mentioned, we're going to do something a little different this morning, which is to give you some time to reflect in this transition between summer and fall. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to follow Israel through this transition moment they had, the transition between the wilderness and the promised land. And I wish I could guarantee that we're moving from a wilderness to a promised land. Can't guarantee that. But um, I can guarantee that I think God wanted to teach Israel some things in this trans transition moment that are really good lessons for us today that we really can apply in terms of how we engage in transition moments like the one we're in right now. So there's two moments that I want to look at today. And the first is the one that we just heard Christina read. Uh, this experience of God telling Israel to take these 12 stones and set up a memorial as they passed through the Jordan River. So a little context for you. This, of course, is after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And they have been wandering around and they've just come up to the eastern side of the Jordan River. And so they're looking west into the promised land, this land that they've been thinking about for 40 years now. And so they can see it. It's, it's right there. It's just 100 yards away, this land of opportunity and the future. But there's this big body of water, the Jordan River, in between the land and where they are. And it's the t season where the river floods. And so you've got to figure out how to get hundreds of thousands of people across this river. And so God, of course, works this amazing miracle. And he cuts off the water upstream and it dries out. And hundreds of thousands of people are able to cross into the promised land. And so it's this, really this, I would say climactic, it's this dramatic way to end the season in the wilderness and to begin this new season in the promised land. It's this really dramatic thing God does for his people. And so I want you just to imagine that moment after they've passed through the river and they're now finally into the promised land, this land of opportunity and blessing, but also this land where there's going to be fortified cities and enemies and all sorts of challenges up ahead. So it's there's an excitement, there's an adrenaline, there's a challenge to the future, and they'd be thinking about all of that. And it would be really easy, I think, just to kind of move forward and start strategizing, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to take down Jericho? What, how are we going to engage in this new land? 
And I love what God has them do in the midst of that moment. He says, no, I want you to just stop. I want you to pause. I want you to celebrate. I want you to look back and remember what I've done. I don't want you to strategize yet. I don't want you to plan yet. I just want you to stop and remember. And so he commands them to take these 12 stones, one from each tribe, out from the dry riverbed now that's dry, that they've just come from, and set it up as a memorial, as a, as a way of remembering the work that he had just done and getting them through the river. And as I see it, those 12 stones don't just represent the miracle of drying up the Jordan. I think they represent for Israel really God's faithfulness through that whole 40 years in the wilderness. It would remind them of that whole stage of their existence. And as they looked back on that 40 years, they would remember, I think, two things. First, of course, they would remember wilderness, meaning they would remember challenge and and trial and hardship and suffering and testing and even futility at times. They remember all of that, but they would also remember the second thing, God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness to protect them those 40 years, to provide for them, to guide them, to lead them, to to do everything that needed to be done so that they could finally arrive at the promised land. And God's faithfulness didn't take away the challenges, right? It didn't, didn't make those easy. It didn't make the wilderness a fun time, but he proved himself to be faithful through every twist and turn of the road. So those 40 years were both a very humbling time, but also a faith-producing time. In this great act at the Jordan River of drying the Jordan, it obviously was to remind them of the great act that God had done in getting them into the wilderness in the first place when he dried up the Red Sea. So the wilderness season was bracketed by these two amazing miracles, these two water miracles, showing them that our God does in fact work miracles, that he can open doors that we think are shut. And so the whole season is bracketed by God's power and God's faithfulness. And so you think about for years to come, people would see these 12 stones that were dry and, you know, parents could tell their kids, those dry stones, those were right in the middle of that big body of water right there. They were at the bottom of that and God dried it up. And now they stand today as this testimony to his faithfulness through this wilderness season. And really, I think That's what they needed to be reminded of most as they're entering into the promised land. They actually didn't need a strategy. They didn't need a plan. They didn't need some solutions for how they're going to go about that. What they needed in the end, I think, was actually faith. They needed to know God is going to be with us. God is going to fight our battles for us. We can trust him in this new place. And, and this is what Joshua actually mentions in this passage, it'll sound funny, but what they needed was fear. They needed to fear the Lord. They needed to fear the Lord more than the nations that lived in in the promised land or any other thing that was going to happen. They needed to reverence the Lord. They needed to know the Lord is powerful. The Lord works miracles. We need to fear him. We need to stay close to him. They needed faith and they needed fear. And so God gave them this wonderful miracle and then he gave them a way of remembering that through these 12 stones a way to focus faith and fear because that's what they would need for the journey ahead. And so I I think that's something that's good for us to do in transition moments. It's it's to before we just start strategizing and planning for what's ahead, it's to actually stop and reflect and remember. It's to set up our own memorial stones, so to speak to remember the challenges of the past season, but more than that, to remember God's faithfulness through it. And here's the truth for Israel. There were challenges in the past and there were gonna be challenges in the future, but what was consistent was God's faithfulness. And that will always be true of us, this side of eternity, right? We're gonna look back on the summer, there were challenges, we can look ahead to the fall, there's gonna be challenges there too, but what is consistent is God's faithfulness. So we wanna take some time right now just to reflect on this past season, to look back, to set up a memorial stone and remember God's faithfulness. So Mark is going to lead us into a time of reflection. So let's now take some time to reflect on this past summer. 
The whole idea of those stones of remembrance draws on a theme that runs throughout Scripture. Scripture regularly calls us to remember, and it regularly warns of the dangers of forgetting. So as we transition into a new season, we want to take time right now to give you the space to do this, to remember. For many of us, the summer has felt like a wilderness season, disorienting, unsettling. And yet, as we look back and remember, we can also see moments of God's faithfulness and provision. So let's take some time to reflect. We're going to put a question on the screen for you to consider. And if you're alone, I encourage you to get out a journal and prayerfully write down your answers as a time of reflection with the Lord. And if you are family or friends, or if you're with your home gathering, take some time to reflect and discuss this together. As the question comes on the screen, hit the pause button and give yourself whatever time you need to do this before continuing. And here is a passage from Joshua 5, 13 through 15. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This is the word of the Lord. So our first reading was about looking back, and now we're going to look at this reading, which is about looking forward. And the context for this short passage is you have Joshua now, and he's this new leader of Israel, and our passage says that he's near Jericho. And Jericho is the first major fortified city that the Israelites would come across in the Promised Land. So I picture Joshua here kind of surveying Jericho, scouting it out, kind of considering his strategy, thinking, how am I gonna, how am I gonna conquer this, this city? But really just kind of looking out ahead to this next stage in, in Israel's journey. And you got to just imagine, like, imagine what Joshua was carrying. Imagine what was on his mind in that moment. Like, he is this new young leader. Um, he is following Moses. I don't know if you've ever thought of us, but those are the biggest shoes in the world to try to fill, right? The people have been used to Moses for 40 years, and Moses has been this amazing leader. Now, imagine having to follow Moses. And he looks into the future, and all he sees is fortified city after fortified city, battle after battle challenges, fears, trying to lead a people. He's never done this before. All that to say, he is, I imagine he feels like he's carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. And in the midst of that, he has this really short but really profound encounter with this mysterious figure that I think really shapes his perspective and changes his perspective about how he thinks about the journey ahead. So what happens is, is he looks up, and he sees this man, it says, with a drawn sword. And I imagine he's startled. And in the moment, Joshua's just assuming this is just a man, right? He's some, some soldier. He's dressed like a soldier. And he's wondering who he is. Now we're going to find out in a second. This is no ordinary human being. This is probably some angelic spiritual creature who's identified as the commander of the Lord's army. But Joshua doesn't know any of that. He just sees this person. And so he asks the question in our passage in verse 13, Are you for us or for our enemies? Meaning, whose side are you on? Are you on our side or are you on their side? I, I need to know that in this moment. And I love the angel's answer. Verse 14, my translation says, the angel, angel replies by saying, neither. Now, literally in the Hebrew, he just says, no. <laughs> are you for us or for our enemies? The answer is no. No to your side, no to your enemy's side. Really, no to the question, I think. it's You're not asking the right question. You're asking the wrong question. I am the commander of the Lord's army. And that is not about your side or about their side. I am on the Lord's side, I think is how this, this figure answers Joshua. Meaning, this is a lot bigger 
than choosing sides between the Israelites and the Canaanites. And here's what I think is going on in this encounter. I, I think God is shifting Joshua's perspective and, and reminding him in this really profound way about this. Joshua, you think you have a battle to fight. You think you have lots of battles to fight, and you're hoping that I'm going to be on your side. You're hoping I'm going to come to your aid in those battles, and of course I will. But the truth is, God's speaking to Joshua, actually, these aren't your battles to fight. These are my battles to fight. This is about my plans and purposes in the world, not yours. It's not about me being on your side. And I am going to use you. I'm going to fight these battles through you. So yes, I will be with you, but the battles belong to me. The plans and purposes are mine, not yours. And if any of you have ever read what happens at the Battle of Jericho and how it goes down, you know that God used that first battle as this profound object lesson to Joshua that indeed the battle belongs to the Lord. All they did was march around the city, you know, seven days, and, and then these walls come crashing down as this profound object lesson that this is God's battle. This is, this is God's fight. And of course, they would still have to fight. They'd still have to put on armor. They'd still have to draw swords. They'd still have to enter into dangerous places. People would die and they would go into war. But Joshua was learning this moment through all of that. Yes, you will have to do that, but this is my battle. This is about my side. It's not about whose side I'm on. So there's this shift in perspective. And Joshua then, I think, <laughs> uh, wisely, he realizes that he's not dealing with just an ordinary human. He's dealing with a supernatural being. And in verse 14, it says that he falls face down to the ground in reverence and asks him, what message does my, lab, my Lord have for his servant? In verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army replies, I love this. Here's the message. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. What message do you have? And what I love is, again, the message wasn't a strategy. The message wasn't a plan for the attack of Jericho. The message was a call to worship. It was Joshua recognize the holiness of this moment, that you are in the presence of the holy and bow and, and worship. That is the message I have for you. Before you fight, before you draw plans, before you strategize, worship, submit, acknowledge that I am the God who is in control and I am holy. And what I love about that, of course, is that encounter reminds us of the encounter that Moses first had when he came to leadership at the burning bush. God said the same thing, right? Take off your sandals because you're in the presence of the holy. And so now Joshua is getting that same kind of experience. And I think, you know, what an encouragement that encounter must have been for Joshua. I mean, this young leader who had the weight of the world on his shoulders, and to, to learn in this moment, hey, you are not carrying this burden on your own. In fact, this isn't even your burden to carry. This isn't your battle to fight. This is God's battle. He's going to fight it through you. But God is with you. God is accomplishing his, his purposes. That's a much bigger perspective than Joshua had before. And I think it was ultimately an encouraging and an empowering perspective. Filled him with faith. And so for us, again, as, as we enter into a new season, into the fall, and as we just consider transitions like this, uh, I think it's, of course, it's appropriate to, to plan and to strategize and to think creatively about what we want to see happen. And many of you have already done that in this past week or two. I'm, I, I'm sure you've thought about the fall and, and you are in full plan, strategize, and go mode. And that's all it's appropriate. But I, I want to remind us that it is most important before our plans and strategies, it's most important to pause and to worship and to acknowledge the presence of our God and to remember the bigger perspective, which is that this is his battle and these are his plans and purposes that are gonna to come to fruition. And so we wanna surrender ourselves to him because ultimately it's about him, it's not about us. So again, Mark is now gonna lead us into a time of reflection as we look forward to the fall. And, and we want to consider the hopes and plans we have, but we also want to just offer this fall to the Lord in prayer. So as we've just considered Joshua's experience, as he was looking ahead to the future, let's look ahead and reflect on the coming fall. What's in front of you? 
Do you have dreams and plans underway? You know, for many of us, we have the tendency to start with what makes sense to us, our ways, our plans, our goals and desires. And in a lot of cases, we charge ahead. But sometimes we make those plans and then think, oh, I really want God to bless my plans. Like Joshua, who wanted to know if the angel was on his side. But do you see how backward that process is? Getting God's blessing is not about hoping for his favor for plans we've made apart from him. It's about stepping into his plans for you from the start, his ongoing work in the world. It's about beginning with God, seeking his heart for you, approaching him with open hands, a posture of surrender to his will, offering him your hopes and your desires, and putting them at his feet. Have your way with me, Lord. Not my will, but your will be done. What do you have for me, Father? So we'll put another question on the screen. And again, I encourage you to hit the pause button and take the time you need to reflect on this with God or discuss with those around you. After that, we'll close with a worship song. I trust in you for every heartbeat as long as I'm alive. Your Just to pray this 
joy and sorrow All for your kingdom's sake Be thou my vision Be thou my hope restore Now and forever You are my great reward Oh Well, we hope this morning has been an encouragement to you. And let me leave you with this benediction as we all move into the fall. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace, gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good word and deed. Amen.